How do you do? For some people, the tenets of Christianity, like the resurrection of Jesus, generate perplexing questions. Where does the search for answers lead? In one man's pursuit of understanding, he traveled through yoga, mysticism, and eventually became an American leader of an Eastern religion. Then, while pursuing enlightenment, he found solid answers to his questions and discovered the real truth when his heart and mind and life were unshackled. Welcome to the New Orleans Blood Bank. Ah, oh, welcome back, Mr. Clark. I've waited the required period of time since our last gave. I, I can give again. Just let me check the records here to make sure. Uh, here it is. Yep. Today's the first day you're eligible to donate again. Sell again. Hmm? I don't donate, I sell. Oh, yes, right. You receive payment for your blood. It's perfectly legitimate. Yes, it is. I don't suppose you're selling your blood to buy a bottle. Pardon? Oh, well, you don't seem like the Skid Row type. You sound educated. I'm not an alcoholic, if that's what you're inferring. Sorry, it's none of my business. No offense taken. As a matter of fact, I've studied at two universities, New Mexico and Oklahoma. I was a music major, piano and composition. What are you doing on the street? I'm uh, searching to see how I fit into the cosmos. You're trying to find yourself. I suppose. How's it going? Well, I've studied the secrets of mysticism, the philosophy of yoga, and a lot on Hinduism, and I'm advancing along the path to enlightenment. Where do you live? Well, I used to go to missions, but the preaching bugged me. Now I usually sleep under the stars. <laughs> well, good luck. Meanwhile, take your jacket off and we'll get started. This is Unshackled, dramatizing true life stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. We see the homeless drift through the city trying to find the next meal, but they wander from more than lack of home or food. They are spiritually adrift as well. For that reason, Pacific Garden Mission addresses both physical and spiritual needs. Thanks to caring friends like you who send financial gifts, all our services are free to the hundreds of men, women, and children who each day come to us for physical help. While here, pastors and counselors also address spiritual needs. Needs which only find their answer in the life-changing good news of Jesus Christ. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3517 in the series, Unshackled the program that makes you face yourself and think. Like many young people, the man in our story had questions about religion. But unlike most, he diligently sought for answers. You'll learn the interesting path his search took as we bring you the classic true story of Stephen Clark, right now on Unshackled. I was born in Colorado in 1941, but was brought up in Amarillo, Texas, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. My family attended church regularly, but it was unfortunately a group more familiar with exploring social issues than teaching the Bible. My folks had a strong marriage, and we were a close, stable family. My dad was my little league coach and scoutmaster. In high school, I was a typical teenager, but one with serious questions. What'd your mom get you for lunch? Bologna, again. Again? You like that stuff? You kidding? No way. I get it because it's cheap. I hear you. Boy, I don't understand my parents. Dad's an administrator at the Department of Interior, and Mom owns two businesses, a modeling agency and a finishing school for girls. With all that, you think they'd give me money for a hot lunch? No, gotta save money. Right. Save it for things important to them. Summer home, nice cars, best TVs. I complain. I like all that. It's just that they're, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, materialistic? Huh? Materialistic. Just learned that in social studies. It means, um, more concerned with possessions and getting ahead than stuff like, uh, relationships, ethics, or helping others. You know, want money, mostly. Yeah, that's them. To me, it just don't feel right. But y'all go to church, right? Yeah, it doesn't seem to make a difference, though. Do you believe in that church stuff? Used to. I'm not so sure. I got to thinking about Jesus rising from the dead. 
I mean, come on. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. It's impossible. I mean, think about it. Someone that's dead and buried, coming back to life. <laughs> no way. Yeah, take it from me. Religion's a farce. God is dead, if he ever existed. Personally, I'm an atheist. I'm not sure I want to go there, though. The other day I found our family Bible collecting dust on an end table, so I picked it up, and it fell open to Corinthians. It talked about Paul caring for these people of Corinth in a way I had never encountered. You know, being cared for that way, not from my parents, not from anyone. Then I came to the verse that said that Jesus is the Son of God, which I thought was interesting but also confusing. So now I had a question. What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? The part I read didn't explain that, so it made me want to investigate more. I stayed up all night reading, but still haven't found what it means yet. Dude, the Bible, it's a book of mythology. Steer clear of it. If you want to find the real answers to life, you got to break away from those childhood fairy tales. The next day, I told Mom about my questions, and she couldn't answer them, so she arranged an appointment with our minister. We met in his office, surrounded by stacks and stacks of books on philosophy, psychology, and world religions. Well, Stephen, I appreciate your sincerity in needing to know these answers, but unfortunately, I have doubts myself about these things. Let's see, I, I could refer you to theologian Rudolf Bultmann and philosopher Carl Jaspers. They'll help with your answers, but I'll save you the trouble. I've concluded from their writings, both of whom I respect, that the resurrection of Jesus could not have happened. But you're a minister. Well, <laughs> let me tell you something in confidence. My research has caused me to question why I'm a minister. I really feel like a hypocrite. I may even leave the church. But let me give you the names of two spiritual leaders you should talk with. One is a religious figure from Greece, and the other is a mystic who, in one of her previous lives, lived on the lost continent of Atlantis. The Greek religious figure was worthless in my pursuit. He completely ignored me and my questions and seemed to want to get rid of me. When his office door closed, I felt that Christianity as a source for answers had also closed. When I arrived at the home of the mystic, she was refreshingly different, warm, kind, and welcoming, and appeared at her door like an angel of light. She spent several hours telling me about her life in Eastern mysticism, and then I told her a little about myself. From what you tell me, I know that young as you are, you're a genuine seeker after the truth. Indeed I am. That's wonderful. You must have good karma. Karma? comes from the Sanskrit word meaning deed. To have this hunger for truth, you must have done many good things in your previous incarnation. What do you mean? You seem to be well along the path of mystical insight. Now, what about the questions that have brought you here? Okay, uh, what does the Bible mean when it calls Jesus the Son of God? Ah, yes. It's very simple, actually. Jesus was an avatar a physical manifestation of one of the Hindu gods of Vishnu, the protector and preserver god. Vishnu has appeared in many human forms. Hindu scriptures record dozens of them. While Jesus isn't listed in these writings, you can be certain this is the true meaning of son of God. He was an avatar. You see? Really? This is all new to you, of course, but I can teach you the secrets of the mystics. Then the possibilities for you through meditation may be almost unlimited. You might eventually attain even the enlightenment of a Christ. Do you really think so? I think you should read the scriptures of Hinduism. I would be willing to tutor you in the secrets of the mystics during these early days of your journey. After studying with her for several months, I was convinced that the greatest wisdom was found in the Eastern religions and that Christianity was insignificant and superficial. By 1967, I was so deeply into mysticism that I joined a Hindu monastery, also called an ashram. I rose rapidly in mastery of yogic techniques and gained increasingly more important responsibilities. The leader of our movement was Swami Sachidodonov, he gained fame as the Swami Guru of the Woodstock Music Festival, 
And in 1969, Swami Sajidadonov summoned me. Peace on you, Brother Stephen. The promptness of your presence confirms to the utmost my regard for you. Thank you. In Los Angeles, our order established an ashram of the community. You have knowledge of this ashram? Yes, yes Swami. Do you have comprehension of the recent reputation of this ashram? I believe, it, Swami, that, that no monks reside there and public classes have dwindled to almost non-existence. I fear its demise. You possess the much insight. I also wish not to see termination of this ashram. Therefore, I determine your posting at Los Angeles ashram with the intent of leading a new awakening in our movement. Brother Stephen, will you be ashram executive director? Oh yes. May I be the realization of your goal for the ashram? Yes, Brother Stephen. I foresee great success. I have vision of you making restoration of resident monks, expand teachings of yogic principles, and blossom to prosperity as yet unknown. Many shall you guide on the path of enlightenment. I was at the Los Angeles Monastery for two and a half years where it became a major New Age Center. Then in 1973, I was assigned major responsibilities at Yogaville, a retreat center in Siegler Springs, California. With a two-week vacation scheduled prior to reporting to Yogaville, I headed back to Amarillo for a family visit. By chance, my first day back, I ran into my atheist friend from high school, so we had lunch together. You actually lived in a monastery, orange robes and all? That was me. Now you're out? I'm between assignments. A few years ago, the Holy Swami sent me to Los Angeles to be the executive director of a monastery that was about to close. My assignment was to revitalize it. Sounds important. It was. I built it into one of the largest New Age centers in the area. We had 15 monks living there, and about 200 people attended our classes each week. I taught meditation and yoga at UCLA, USC, prisons and psych hospitals, and I was vice president of the governing boards of five West Coast monasteries. Wow, impressive. So you must have found the answers to the questions you had in high school about the Bible and Christianity? I discovered that the Bible and Christianity are really irrelevant in one's spiritual journey. The answers are in the secrets of the mystics. Steve, with all due respect, I think you're committed in psycho-spiritual suicide. What do you mean? I mean, all this mystic stuff is a lie. <laughs> I should expect that from an atheist. Not anymore. Steve, I've done my own investigation, and I not only believe there is a God, but Jesus Christ oh, is... Oh, hold on there. You believe in God? What finally brought you to that conclusion? The evidence became too much to refute. It would take more faith on my part to believe that the beauty and wonder and miracles of the world happened by accident, a fluke, than by the possibility of a master designer. How do you mean? Well, I started looking at the intricacies of the human body, how nerves wind their way through the body in a precise order, how the brain, which weighs about three pounds and is 75% water, controls every aspect of our body while at the same time retaining our memory. I learned how our eyes work and our ears. There's no way that could happen by chance or evolved out of some primordial soup. Well, Sir Isaac Newton once said, in the absence of any other proof, the thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. Exactly. Well, I'm glad you finally believe in a supreme being. But continue, I, I interrupted you. Uh, you were saying something about Jesus? Yes. I now believe in God, and I also believe that Jesus is God. And when he died, he rose from the dead and walked again upon the earth. Yes, Jesus was an avatar of Vishnu, and his spirit left that body to return and protect mankind. <laughs> You've obviously studied Hinduism more than Christianity. Jesus was not an avatar, but the one true God who physically rose from the dead. But the stories of his physical resurrection and appearing to his friends were fabricated by his disciples. They were outright lies. Steve, all his disciples, except one who was exiled for his belief and eventually died of old age, except him, all were killed because they believed Jesus physically rose from the dead and then appeared to them. People will die for a falsehood if they believe it's the truth, but nobody, let alone the entire group, would die for something they know is a lie. Some falsehood they fabricated. Doesn't happen. Hmm. Well, you make an interesting point. Uh, I'll meditate on this for a while. 
Can we meet again? I'd like that. <laughs> and before you meditate, try praying this prayer. God, show me who Jesus is. Deep within me, I had the feeling that my friend might be right. But I was so invested in the knowledge and in the position I had in Eastern religion that I couldn't openly admit it. Rather than heading to my new responsibilities at Yogaville, I received permission to stay in Texas two additional weeks. Over that time, my friend and I had many long conversations. So you see, psychologically speaking, the claim that his appearances were actually hallucinations doesn't stack up. Well over 500 people saw him after his death. Different locations, different times of day, different circumstances, different sized groups. And most of those 500 were still alive when the Apostle Paul challenged skeptics to interview them and prove them wrong. What about the fact that there are many paths to attain oneness with God? Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to God. All other so-called ways lead away from the true God. I still have my original question. What does the phrase Son of God mean? It means He is God with all the attributes of the one supreme eternal Father God. Jesus came into this world as fully God in full human form and voluntarily submitted himself to the authority of God the Father. He died to make us right with God. I'm still confused about reconciliation with God. The word basically means to bring enemies together. Here, see? Romans 5. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God in human form died for your sins and my sins. When we receive Jesus as our savior, he washes our sins away with his blood. And that makes us no longer enemies of God, but reconciled with God. But there are a lot of good people who strive to help our fellow men. The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Being made right with God is not something we gain by good works, avoiding evil or meditating. It is a gift we must receive. Our belief systems were mutually exclusive. Something had to give. We'll find out what gave in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. More exciting things take place at Pacific Garden Mission than we can possibly report during this program. In addition to news from unshackled around the world, our staff ministers to the poor and homeless in Chicago, trains men and women recovering from lives of substance abuse and many other services to the homeless. And since there is not time enough to report everything during this program, we'd like to do it through a monthly newsletter filled with pictures and articles to inform and inspire you. It is called the PGM News, and you can subscribe free just by writing to us. And while the mission is graciously underwritten by people just like you, a subscription to our newsletter is free. Write today and ask for your free subscription to PGM News. Write us at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Our email address is unshackled at pgm.org. Swami Sajidadonov allowed an extension of my two-week vacation for an additional two weeks. That would end soon. Steve, we've been meeting like this for nearly a month. When do you head for Yogaville? I won't be. I did something last night that annuls my assuming of responsibilities there. What's that? Well, I wrote a letter to Swami Satchidonov and severed my relationship with the monastery and his movement. Wow, that's big. Why? I didn't explain why. But can I trust your confidence on this? Sure. Well, deep down, I believe you're right in what you've been telling me. 
I find it extremely difficult to admit this, but I can't at this point express my belief publicly. I've invested too much in the study of Hinduism and yoga. I just can't turn my back on all that now. We continued meeting several times a week for the next 18 months. We discussed things like philosophy, psychology, and history, all with the goal of my understanding Christianity. I was no longer convinced Hinduism was the answer. But unwilling to relinquish all my training, I also spent those months trying to blend the secrets of the mystics, the tenets of yoga, and the teachings of Eastern religions along with the Bible and Christianity. You know, Steve, you're not going to get anywhere trying to blend Hinduism with Christianity. They're incompatible. I'm not so sure. There must be a synthesis between them. Can I give you some advice? Sure. Set all your ideas from Hinduism, meditation, and yoga aside, just for a while. Read through the New Testament, books in order, Matthew through Revelation, and ask God to open your eyes as you read. On August 23, 1974, I experienced a total crisis of identity. I awoke feeling utterly empty inside, an unbearable anguish over the futility of my life. I suddenly realized my involvement in mysticism and Eastern religions and other past deeds were offensive to God. I decided to take my friend's advice and read the New Testament. I was touched by Romans 1-4. Jesus Christ our Lord was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. My question about the meaning of Son of God was answered. And then on the sixth morning, after I started reading the Bible, I awoke and resumed reading Ephesians. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's it. I can have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Forgiveness. Oh, God, thank you. God, I'm a sinner, a, a terrible sinner trying to save myself. But now I, I receive your gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's exciting. I've been praying that God would open your eyes. I'm just sorry it took so long to realize the truth. I was looking in the wrong place. Where did you learn all this stuff anyway? Some independent study, but I also got a BA in religion from Dallas Baptist College. That's it. That's what I want. In God's plan, my salvation came just as the fall term began. Three days later, I was a student at Dallas Baptist College, preparing to serve God in some way or another. The next spring, I met a nursing student named Gloria. She and I became good friends during our time in school together. Can't believe graduation's next week. And you'll be a nurse. After I pass my state boards. Have your plans finalized yet? Got the letter today. I'm accepted for graduate school. Great. Where? How long's the program? Two years in Wheaton, Illinois. It concludes with a trip to Israel, Rome, Turkey, and Greece. Can we keep in touch? We did keep in touch and saw each other as often as possible. Then soon after Steve got his master's degree in biblical studies and returned from his trip to Europe, we were married. It was several years later, but I still remember the day he came home with important news. How's the baby? A little colic earlier, I think. Hmm. Well, it seems okay now. Mm -hmm. I've got some news. What's that? I believe I finally found the first full-time ministry the Lord has for us. The youth outreach in Illinois? Sort of. How do you know? It must have been God putting it in my mind. Actually, the Wheaton Youth Outreach wants us to start a program called Jubilee Shelter for Women. They have a large house where I'll be the program coordinator, and we'll both serve as house parents. What kind of a shelter? Well, we'll take in young women suffering from domestic violence, drug abuse, eating disorders, single mothers, that type of thing. Oh. It sounds just like what we've been praying for. Thank you, Lord. 
We served there for two and a half years, working with more than 50 young women. But with the birth of our fourth child, it became increasingly more difficult to manage the care of the five or six women in the shelter. At the same time, I had a definite sense of God leading me into a ministry of teaching the Word of God, the teaching I didn't have growing up. When we left the shelter, we moved to Hazlitt, New Jersey, where Gloria's mother lived. After joining a local Bible teaching church, I was asked to become a deacon and was named chairman of both the evangelism and church growth committees. Eventually, God called Steve to a church where he faithfully served God as pastor. He gives God all the glory for the accomplishments since his salvation and earnestly tells others that the answers to meaning in life do not come from mysticism or any of the Eastern religions. The meaning of life comes only when you yield your life to Jesus Christ. That's done by first admitting you're a sinner and repenting, turning your back on your sin. That's accompanied by the belief that receiving Jesus and his gift of forgiveness is the only way to satisfy God. Then, acting on that belief by receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's your desire, why not pray this little prayer with me right now? Dear Lord, I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sinful ways. Please forgive me and make me the new person you promised I could be. Save me, Lord that I may know you and follow you. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.